Well, uh, thank you everyone for um, coming and joining me today um, as I present my doctoral defense. Um, I specifically want to acknowledge and, and thank my dissertation committee, uh, Dr. Toby Hawking, Dr. Dan Buscombe, Dr. Rebecca Best, and Dr. Adam Kayser. Um, their support throughout this has just been incredible and uh, definitely would not have been possible without them. So um, the title of this presentation and of my dissertation is Automated Mapping of Gulf Sturgeon Spawning Habitat in Coastal Plain Rivers, Case Study in the Pearl and Pascagoula River Systems. And I'm hoping everyone out in Zoom can hear me, and I think they should. All right, so today I'm just going to be stepping through each of my dissertation chapters and, and the highlights from each. Uh, chapter one is the introductory information about Gulf sturgeon sonar habitat mapping and the motivation of this research. Chapter two is uh, introduces Ping Mapper, the open source software that I've developed. Chapter three is about automated substrate mapping, which has been integrated into a second version of Ping Mapper. Chapter four is uh, the application of that sonar to mapping suitable Gulf sturgeon spawning habitat. And finally, I'll conclude with a summary of the contributions of this research and uh, potential directions for future research. So Gulf sturgeon are a fish species found in the Southeastern United States and the Gulf of Mexico. They're a long lived fish and have been in the fossil record for only for over 225 million years. Uh, they're quite large. They can reach lengths of up to one and a half meters. Males reach sexual maturity at the age of seven, while females reach sexual maturity at the age of 12. Historically, Gulf sturgeon populations were quite numerous. In the early 1800s, there were over 30,000 adults in the Suwannee River alone. However, in the late 1800s, their population began to decline. This was largely due to increased fishing pressure, fishing pressure um, to get caviar, um, and as, also as a result of bycatch from targeting other species. Physical barriers like dams and low head dams uh, block uh, upstream access to important spawning habitats. They're also impacted by significant natural disasters like uh, hurricanes. And then of course, the human, other human caused disasters such as the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010 and just general degradation of water quality in their habitat. So for these reasons, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA listed them as a threatened species in 1991. Gulf sturgeon are an anadromous fish. So that means that they feed in the marine uh, Gulf, Gulf of Mexico areas in the fall into the winter. And then they migrate hundreds of kilometers upstream into freshwater river systems. Uh, that occurs in the spring and the summer. Um, and that's when they're doing uh, spawning as well as uh, resting during the hotter portions of the year. Uh, the critical Habitat is shown here in uh, purple with a uh, Swanee to, let's see, let me grab my laser pointer. The Swanee River over here in uh, Florida and then bound to the west with the Pearl River in uh, Mississippi. So genetic studies have shown that uh, the Western population is genetically distinct from the Eastern population with the dividing line being the Mobile Basin. The Western population uh, in particular has a small population. It's estimated that their abundance is well below carrying capacity. And very little is known about spawning behavior in these river systems. Multiple studies throughout the years have uh, located uh, Gulf sturgeon spawning sites. Uh, many have been located in the eastern population. However, we only have one in the Bowie River for the western population. So the goal of this research is to increase our understanding of where Gulf sturgeon might be spawning in these river systems, and that will be used to help manage and restore Gulf sturgeon uh, habitat and the species. So what makes good spawning habitat? 
From those studies, findings have been confirmed with uh, retrieval of Gulf sturgeon eggs. And several parameters are documented um, in these locations, which is shown in the table. We can see that they travel far upstream and experience, and these habitats are in a wide range of depths. But an important thing for this study is that the substrates are always gravels, cobbles, bedrock, and lime, lime rock banks. And so that allows the eggs to adhere to the substrates. So this study is focused on locating and quantifying suitable spawning habitat. And I forgot to mention, this is a confirmed spawning location on the Suwannee River. This portion of the channel is primarily sand, while this portion of the channel where they found most of the eggs are uh, the hard rocky substrates. So how are we going to locate these habitats in the Pearl and Pascagoula systems? These, these coastal plain rivers are non-weightable, meaning they're really deep, they're turbid, and that limits our, my ability to uh, measure the benthic environment with uh, air and space-based remote sensing. They also cover large spatial extents, and so that limits the use of traditional transect-based surveys. And so this is where a technology called side scan sonar can help. So since we're gonna be talking a lot about side scan sonar, we need to get a grasp of what it looks like. And so this is a simulation of what uh, data collection would look like on a sonar system. As we can see with the, the movement of the of the side scan, the, the vessel is moving and constantly pinging as it's moving along. That pinging is happening with two separate beams called side scans to the port and the starboard side. And so that allows us, allows the technology to create an image of what the bed looks like. There's also a single beam sonar, which is oriented at nadir, looking directly beneath the boat, which helps to measure depths. And then additionally on the side, we can see that there's other ping, ping attributes, I call them, related to timestamp as well as the vessel position. But what's the strange anomaly in the center? If we take that sonar image and kind of fold it like an accordion, we can start to see that there's actually three dimensions present in this image. That's because when you emit a ping, the transducer is instantly listening for any returns. So as the, the sound is traveling through the water column, um, it's collecting any data that it can. And then as soon as it starts to hit the bed, then we're collecting more information in the Y direction. It's important to be able to accurately measure that water column beneath the boat because it needs to be masked and removed and then the subsequent imagery slant range corrected in order to create geographically correct imagery. But there, there will be more on that later. In the mid 2000s, uh, Adam Kayser and Tom Litz uh, started to use these really inexpensive um, sonar systems called fish finders. So quite, quite inexpensive, less than a thousand dollars, but they can get more expensive from there, of course. They developed a series of tools, um, which were in ArcGIS, which allowed them to take the data from the sonar system and generate ge geometrically correct imagery of the bed. And then through visual interpretation and manual delineation, pull out different uh, substrate and habitat features from the imagery. This generated a lot of interest in the aquatic world and led to other applications of these inexpensive fish finders. People have uh, located um, large woody debris, enumerated fish, mapped and, and quantified meso habitats, and also mapping submerged aquatic vegetation. This is all great, but the cons to this approach is that the, the processing is largely manual and you have to develop a, a good amount of expertise in order to delineate these features from the imagery. So efforts to automate um, 
this processing came with uh, Dan's work um, with a open source program called PyHum. It's written in Python and it would decode Hummingbird sonar recordings to extract the data from them. And then he was able to generate these automated, automated texture length scale classifications. This was a great and significant step forward in processing these data sets. However, this approach was limited to older sonar models. The software was difficult to install and um, eventually just wasn't maintained anymore. And it's also unsure how well the texture length scale maps relate to substrate features. So this leads me to my uh, research questions and the motivation for this research. My first question is, can deep learning algorithms be used to automatically segment and classify benthic substrates from recreation grade side scan sonars in an efficient and reproducible manner? Second, where are Gulf sturgeon spawning substrates located on the Pearl and Pascagoula River systems? How much is available? And when are these substrates ac accessible? Finally, what river reaches and habitats likely support Gulf sturgeon spawning in the Pearl and Pascagoula River basins? Each of these questions are addressed in a chapter, which with question one being split across chapter two and chapter three, and the remaining two questions are addressed in chapter four. In order to address each of these questions, I've developed a series of five objectives, which we are going to be stepping through today. Let's jump into chapter two, which is about ping mapping. Object objective one is develop an open source and reproducible tool set for processing sonar recordings from Hummingbird sonar instruments. How am I going to do that? Well, first we need to figure out how to reverse engineer that file to, in order to determine the file structure of these newer Hummingbird systems. Second, develop an open source and automated workflow uh, built in Python. And then finally export those data sets that we need from the Hummingbird recording. Let's look at what the data from these Hummingbird systems look like. So if you open up the files in Notepad, uh, you just see a bunch of gobbledygook. I mean, I can't read that. Uh, so we need to have some sort of knowledge about where the data are located within this file. So as I mentioned, Dan did that initial work with PyHum to decode the file. Um, but it was limited to specific models. And so I used what Dan did and further interrogated newer models and figured out that there is an underlying commonality between all of these sonar files uh, that I can use to exploit and extract the data that I need. And so here's an example of what that data looks like, um, the ping attributes in particular. In summer of 2022, I released the first version of Ping Mapper and with an associated companion manuscript in Earth and Space Science. Ping Mapper will first decode uh, sonar recordings from any Hummingbird sonar system. It will export the ping attributes, correct the sonograms by uh, using the sensor depth to remove the water column, and then slant range correct the imagery. And finally, generate georectified mosaics, data sets that you can bring into any type of GIS. To further make this um, efficient and accessible, uh, I developed uh, multi-threaded processing within the program, which scales with the compute resources that you have available on your computer. In this example, this is a one hour long recording, uh, which was taken across nine kilometers of a river. It took a eight threaded, um, just rinky dink laptop, uh, 40 minute, 41 minutes to process every data set that was available in Ping Mapper at the time. If you were only interested in exporting the sonar mosaics, which is generally what you want, uh, it takes about two, two minutes per kilometer. And so with this uh, chart over here, we can see that as the number of threads or the, the better computer that you have available, your processing time is able to come down. I also enabled, um, added a batch processing uh, 
workflow within the within the software. This is, allows for sequential processing of multiple sonar recordings. Why is that important? Well, it means you can go out for a day, you can collect a series of sonar recordings, head back to the office after at the end of the day, set ping mapper up to process those files, and by the next morning you're going to have data sets that you can work with. With the release of ping mapper version 1.0 that satisfies the first objective. Now we're going to talk about automated substrate mapping. With objective 2, uh, I'm seeking to develop automated and reproducible approach to segmenting and classifying benthic substrates from recreation grade side scan sonar systems. An overview of the methods. So first I want to filter those sonograms in order to remove pixels which are not related to substrates. Second, I'm going to create uh, substrate labels and I do that through my own visual interpretation and delineation, which I have prior experience doing. I'll use those uh, data sets to train substrate segmentation models and predict and map substrates with those models and finally validate the model results by comparing the predictions to a holdout test set. So in this figure, we see what uh, masking non-substrate pixels looks like. In this left image, we see that we have the water column at the top, which we've already discussed, and we have this area in the center, which are pixels related to the bed. And then finally, since we're scanning a river, uh, we see uh, the edge of the riverbank here, which is causing no data in this area. So I used an open source program called Make Sense to delineate a boundary around those bed polygons and finally generate a series of masks, which can be used to mask that sonar image, but can also be used to train deep learning algorithms so that I don't have to do it manually. So I use a program Dan developed called Segmentation Gym to do this. And with that training set in hand, neural networks can be trained to learn the image and label mapping. Uh, segmentation Gym rap allows rapid prototyping of these types of approaches. Gym implements several model architectures shown to be suitable for processing and segmenting earth science imagery. Hyperparameters are able to be set via configuration file to tune model training. During the training process, the model learns to extract features from the image that are then mapped to the classification. The predicted classes are compared to the label, a loss is computed, and the model weights are updated. This iterative process continues until the loss between predicted output and the label is minimized. So I. I used um, the depth labels to um, train a depth model. But why did I need to do that? Uh, we are already collecting depth information from the hummingbird, and so can't we just use that? Well, the depth predictions are not always accurate. So in this image, we see portions where the depth prediction is not sticking to the bed, and so this will create anomalies in the imagery which are undesirable. And this is particularly um, uh, important and critical in river systems, which are often turbid and have a lot of noise in the water column, which causes the sensor to have inaccurate depth predictions. I found a method developed by Zhang et al. in 2021, which used uh, deep learning to uh, automatically segment these sonar images. I trained a model with Jim and implemented it in, in Ping Mapper. And now we see, and sorry for the colorblind folks, but we have a, a blue line that is a much better prediction of where the bed is located. And that gives us a much better slant range corrected image. Using the shadow portion of the label data sets, uh, I can train a second model to filter out the shadows in these images. So again, we're in a river system and we have uh, the edge of the river here, 
the riverbank, and then all of this uh, black area, which is no data and um, needs to be filtered and removed from the image. With that second model, the it can automatically locate those areas, mask them, and filter them out from the final product. And so you end up with a, a much cleaner image and uh, something that's more conducive to uh, labeling substrate. Another uh, advancement um, in this second version of Ping Mapper 2.0 has to do with corrections of the raw sonar intensities. So you may have noticed that in all of these sonar images, we have very bright returns towards the center, which are locations which are close to the sensor and giving us a better um, return. But as the sound travels further and further from the transducer, we see attenuation of that signal and a loss of the returns coming back. So I just happened to stumble across a correction called empirical gain normalization. It's available in uh, proprietary softwares uh, such as SonarWiz, but all it is is just an averaging of the of the sonar pixels in ranges, and then using that averaging to uh, balance the sonar intensities and normalize the imagery. And so we see a much more balanced image as a result and a normal distribution of our data. And this is particularly uh, relevant when we see uh, the imagery uh, rectified. Uh, there are some sort of features which look like wood over here and maybe some harder features in this portion, but those, those features start to stand out much better once we have those corrections and also the, the bed, bed forms, uh, the bedrock. So pretty cool, I think. Okay, now we're gonna start talking about substrate. We've talked about a whole lot about not substrate. I developed a, a classification scheme for the types of features that I was able to identify in the sonar imagery that we collected in the Pearl and Pascagoula River systems. Uh, these, these top classes are uh, fine or soft classes, I call them, are sand, silt, muds, and clays and likely gravels as well. Uh, and it's important to identify these substrates because they are the most dominant class in coastal plain rivers. And so since we're looking for the harder rocky substrates, through a process of elimination, we can help to identify reaches which have uh, conducive spawning habitat. The coarser or hard classes are more rare in coastal plain rivers and are likely more conducive to sturgeon spawning. Uh, and another feature which is very easy to distinguish in the imagery is large woody debris. So I created a class for that as well. Very common to coastal plain rivers and is important refugia for uh, gulf sturgeon as well as a variety of other species. In order to validate my interpretation of these different substrate features, I, I did a fairly exhaustive review of the sonar imagery and picked out different features within that imagery, which I thought belonged to those classes that we were just talking about. I then used those maps and went out uh, for a week in Mississippi and visited these locations and was able to confirm that I am able to uh, locate these different types of features in the field. So that's great. Now we can move on to developing a substrate training set. In order to build the data set, I used another of Dan's programs called Doodler, and I was involved as a co-author on the companion manuscript where we were able to confirm that Doodler was conducive to labeling these sonar imagery. With Doodler, you load the image into the, into the software, you then scribble the different types of classes that you see present within the, the sonar image. And then Doodler trains a multi-layer perceptron from those uh, scribbles for an initial prediction and refines those class boundaries with a conditional random field. This results in a pixel-wise classification of the substrates within the image. It takes uh, 
only about 30 seconds to doodle an image and a minute or two for um, a computer to generate this label. And so it's a very efficient way to generate these data sets. And it also doesn't require me to determine where that uh, discrete boundary should be between classes. Using segmentation, Jim, I then uh, trained models using this imagery. And now we can take a look at some of those results. I was able to use uh, the raw imagery and the EGN imagery to train two separate substrate models. I did a five-fold cross-validation to determine accuracy on a test set. Each image labor label pair appeared once in the data set, and finally, pixel-wise accuracy metrics were calculated. We see from these figures that both uh, models achieved a 70%, 78% accuracy um, when compared to my hand-drawn labels. And the, the most common classes in the system are also experiencing some of the highest accuracies as well. Importantly, hard bottom is also coming out uh, high as well. And then uh, less exciting results from these other classes, but still overall, we're able to, I'm able to uh, generate some, some good looking predictions with these models. So even though the raw and the EGN uh, models had similar accuracies, we can see times when the prediction from the raw model has high agreement with the EGN model and times when there's low agreement between the two models. So with the high agreement, here's the, the label, which is the same for both images, and then the EGN correct prediction on top and the raw prediction on bottom. You can see that they're very close to each other um, in their agreement, and they're also doing fairly well with uh, predicting uh, based off of what the label looks like. Now there's times when the EGN model does better than the raw model, and there's times when the raw model does better than the EGN model, resulting in disagreement between these two. And so in this case, the EGN model is outperforming the raw model. Uh, we see all of this misclassification by the raw model here. Um, and in this particular instance, it's because these features are able to be brought out better in the with the EGN corrected imagery, where it's fairly obscured to be able to find those features. But we have two models, and so that means we can generate two maps from them and validate those in the field to actually determine how accurate these maps are. So using the uh, substrate, the two substrate models that I generated, I implemented those into Ping Mapper version 2.0, which has been released and the uh, companion manuscript is in review currently. Uh, so substrate predictions can be generated with both of those models. And I repurposed the existing uh, georeferencing workflows to generate these maps. And so you can see that um, they are similar, but there are differences as well. But overall, the distribution of the substrates is fairly similar. So I, I think that's pretty encouraging. So with the release of that second version of King Mapper, uh, I've satisfied objective two. Now we're going to jump into chapter four, which is mapping suitable spawning habitat for Gulf sturgeon, the application of these methods. So objective three is to map substrate distribution across 1200 river kilometers in the Pearl and Pascagoula River systems. That required data collection of all 1,200 river kilometers with hummingbird sonar systems, use the second version of Ping Mapper to batch process the sonar recordings. Models are then, the models are used to predict the substrate type. The predictions are georeferenced to create a map. And finally, a field-based accuracy assessment to validate the map. We haven't talked about the study area a whole lot, um, but the, the, the study area comprises seven different river systems and two watersheds. We have the Bogachitta River, 
right here, which flows into the main stem of the Pearl, the Bowie River, which flows into the Leaf River, which flows into the main stem of the Pascagoula River, and then the Chickasawahe River here, and the Chunky River, which is not labeled up here. There are several barriers on these systems, one which is completely impassable on the Pearl River, the Ross R. Barnett Reservoir, and then a few low head dams, which may limit uh, upstream passage of the species at lower flows. There's also another uh, uh, low head dam, which is actually located at the confirmed spawning location. In total, 1,200 kilometers, like I mentioned, Data collection took place over 2021 to 2023 in late winter to early summer when water, water levels are the highest. Uh, hummingbird, Solix, uh, mega uh, side scans were used to scan the imagery. A range of 25 to 35 meters per side was used. Depths range two to four meters. In total, 172 hours of sonar recordings were collected. This took 38 field days to collect. Two of those days were with six boats, so 44 days worth of effort. Lots of data. And so we have, I have Ping Mapper version 2.0, and so we can, I can use it to automatically map those substrates. So 172 hours of sonar recordings, that translates into 31 billion sonar returns, which is pretty cool. I used a 12 core Intel computer to process those data sets. It took my computer six days of pr constant processing to generate the maps that we're going to be talking about that averages about five minutes per kilometer. A very optimistic estimation of me manually delineating those data sets would be 17 and a half days of 24 hours just constant manual mapping. I'm very happy I didn't have to do that. This resulted in 40,000 discrete polygons and 7,400 hectares of mapped in-stream area. For a spatial reference, uh, that's 55% of the Ross R. Barnett Reservoir at full capacity or 12% of the uh, surface of Lake Powell. but how accurate are these maps really in the field? So ground truthing has taken place uh, last fall in the early part of, of this year. Random reaches were assessed to determine the substrate type. Uh, USM, University of Southern Mississippi, hey guys, um, are, have been doing the, the lion's share of data collection. Uh, primarily just with a poll or, or waiting if they can, but their assessment technique was validated by using U.S. Fish and Wildlife divers, which were actually able to go down and validate uh, what the substrate was. We use those field classifications to compare with the automated substrate maps to get the final accuracy, and in total, 300 sites were visited across the seven systems. Now for the accuracy of results. So I took the field classification, crosswalked it to the map class. Field sample locations were buffered by uh, five meters. This is to help account for compounding positional errors from the sonar and field GPSs, as well as difficulty in maintaining vessel positions while you're validating these locations. And a point was considered correct if a mapped polygon sharing the classification fell within that buffer. We, I have an overall accuracy for both models of nearly 70%, uh, which I think is pretty encouraging. It might not sound too awesome to some of you folks, but uh, considering that these were all automatically generated maps, I think that's a very good result. In particular, we see that the most common class is coming out with our highest accuracies. And we have fairly good um, accuracy with our harder substrates as well. And so, uh, yeah. So that satisfies objective three. And now I'll turn, move on to objective fours. I have these really fine grained um, maps of what substrate distribution is. 
how do you make sense of that across 1200 kilometers? And so objective four is to synthesize the substrate variability and distribution to help make sense of that. In order to do so, I generated a series of summary extents, which are half a kilometer up to 10 kilometers of the river systems. Using those summary extents, calculate a series of statistics from the maps, and finally generate plots to understand the longitudinal trends within these systems. Before I talk about the details of what these plots show, I wanna kind of step you through them first. So we're seeing a uh, one kilometer summary reaches in, in this plot, uh, and the colors indicate the proportion of that reach which belongs to a given substrate, which is shown by the color here. And the plots are also stacked. Each plot is belongs to one of the seven rivers with the westernmost rivers at the top down to the easternmost rivers at the bottom. And then they are stacked by distance to the Gulf of Mexico with the downstream most extent to the left and the upstream most extent to the right. With two models, we can generate two uh, different maps, which are then summarized here. So overall, the big takeaway, I think, is that we're seeing very similar distribution of substrates within these systems based on both of the both of the uh, models. Um, and the hotter colors, which are the oranges and the reds, are the finer substrates, which to be expected take up the lion's share of these river systems. We also see that the, the, the models are picking out similar locations shown here on the pearl, for example, where we have higher proportions of hard substrates. And so these are going to be the types of areas that we're looking for for Gulf sturgeon spawning. But you may notice that the raw model is in general predicting a higher proportion of hard substrates, which is an interesting result. And uh, this is particularly true with the Chickasawahe and the Chunky River, where the raw model is finding much more hard substrate than the EGN model. But the overall takeaway is that we're still honing into similar reaches by using both of these approaches. That satisfies objective four. And now the last objective. Objective five, identify river reaches with suitable spawning substrates for Gulf sturgeons. So I can take those map summaries, those, those longitudinal summaries and actually plot them in space where they actually belong. Uh, this will allow me to pinpoint reaches with the highest proportion of substrates, and then again, make a comparison between the raw and the EGN. So in this very busy plot, but uh, what is hopefully a very informative plot, uh, we have the overview of all seven rivers shown here and the proportion of hard substrates for a 10 kilometer extent with darker colors indicating a higher proportion of hard substrates. And then I've identified uh, six different segments on five rivers with uh, more than 10% hard substrate for a one kilometer reach. And so we can quickly see that uh, the Pearl River has a larger area of hard substrates but, in gen but the Chunky River has the highest proportion of hard substrates. But the raw model, and this is for the raw model, I should have said that, um, we have uh, several other locations where we can start to potentially find uh, Gulf sturgeon spawning substrates. And I'll also have you notice here on the Chickasawahe River, that larger proportion of hard substrates. In contrast to the EGN prediction. So we'll go with the, the negative part first. Uh, the Chickasawahe River really does not, um, the EGN model really does not predict a high proportion of hard substrates in these areas. Uh, this is also true with the Bowie River and that upper extent of the leaf. But there are three segments which are in closer agreement with the raw model. 
and that still is the section on the Pearl River, the section on the Chunky River, and then this lower portion on the Leaf River. So they're still keying into similar locations on, on these river systems. And so that can help to inform uh, our search for, for potential spawning. So where are Gulf sturgeon spawning on these river systems? At this point, that's still unclear. It's because hard substrates alone do not indicate suitable spawning habitat. But these maps have eliminated over a thousand kilometers of river system from consideration. Those maps compared with residency by Gulf sturgeon in those reaches will help to determine the spawning period and help to narrow the search in the future. And finally, a confirmation of a reach being a spawning habitat will be confirmed with egg collection and other analyses. And that concludes the fifth objective. And I would like to just summarize uh, the, research, the research that I've done and the contributions of this research. I've created a program called Ping Mapper, which is an open source software that provides workflows for processing data sets from hummingbird recordings, automates the substrate mapping process, and this can be applied to other river systems in the future. These new data sets provide the first complete picture of substrate distribution and benthic conditions on the Pearl and Pascagoula river systems. And finally, these maps will facilitate locating suitable spawning reaches for Gulf sturgeon on these systems and potentially others in the future. As for future research, um, map accuracy, right? 70%. I think that's good, but clearly we can do better. And how is that going to happen? I propose an iterative approach. The slide is janky. Um, so how are we going to do that? First, uh, scan more aquatic systems. Then we can map substrates with Ping Mapper, validate those maps in the field, use that knowledge to correct and refine those maps, which can be used to generate new data sets, which can be used to train new models and implement it into subsequent versions of Ping Mapper and that process goes on and on until we're satisfied with the results. And with that, I want to thank you all for attending. I want to acknowledge my funding source, the Open Ocean Trustee Implementation Group to restore natural resources injured by the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as NSF. My project partners at the US Fish and Wildlife Service, Adam and Channing St. Aubin, the University of Southern Mississippi, Mike, Casey, Eric, Caleb, Alyssa, and Catherine, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service divers that helped out. And finally, uh, my wife, who supported me through all of this, my family, friends, and all those Ping Mapper early adopters out there. Thank you very much. <laughs>